All right, we're now rolling. Hello and welcome to the Texas Public Radio Town Hall meeting on pre-K for SA. I'm David Martin Davies. This is a public forum being recorded for broadcast on KSTX, Texas Public Radio. We're also live on the internet with Nowcast SA. This event is made possible with support from the members of Texas Public Radio and the Vethan Law Firm and ESD Digital Advertising and Communications. On November 6th, San Antonio will vote on raising the sales tax one-eighth of a cent to fund a citywide full-day pre-K program. Mayor Julian Castro says this will change the education future for San Antonio. Opponents say the plan is too weak on details and won't provide the promised results. This is a chance for the community to speak out on the issue and ask questions from the experts and policymakers. So here's how the town hall will work. We're going to give each of our panelists three minutes to uh, open up and explain their view on things. I'll ask questions. We'll open up to the floor. We've got questions from the Internet we've received from our listeners. I'm also I'm looking forward to a civil exchange of ideas. We want to hear from all sides. Try and keep your comments or your questions brief so we can get hear as many people as we can. And I'm sure, you know, we are all interested in a city. We're trying to do the best for our children in San Antonio. So let's uh, quickly, I'm going to introduce our panelists, and then we'll come back around, and we'll have a chance to uh, get comments from them. First off, we have uh, from the City Council District 6, uh, Ray Lopez. Uh, City Council District 8, Reed Williams. Jeff Judson, he's a senior fellow and director of the Heartland Institute and a member of the local Tea Party. Dr. John Folks is a retired superintendent for Northside ISD. Richard Pettis is the president of the Greater San Antonio Chamber of Commerce. And we have Lori Taylor. She's a professor of Texas A&M's Bush School of Government and Public Service. We also have some other experts with this, uh, from the city who are here uh, who could answer some of the tough questions, uh, like uh, city manager Cheryl Scully. She's also present. But let me uh, get uh, some, questions, some uh, opening comments from our panel. And we will open up first with uh, Ray Lopez from District 6, City Councilman. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. And quite honestly, thank uh, this crowded room for taking the time. Quite honestly, uh, quite a bit early. Uh, well, I think we're 50 days away from the election. But to take an interest in this issue uh, early on to make sure you understand uh, the ups and the downs, the lefts and the rights of it is, is important. It says a lot about our community. Uh, we have been on a, on a path to... They're trying to figure out what the city should be doing with respect to our SA 2020 initiatives. Uh, as m most of you know, and probably many of you participated in our SA 2020 initiative over the course of uh, several months uh, with an awful lot of people talking about what we thought we wanted to look like. Uh, there were a lot of issues that were identified. The two largest issues, uh, one being education, the other one being transportation. But that's easy, probably easier to come up with those two topics to go after, much more difficult to figure out how you go about doing them. And both of those issues are incredibly difficult, you know, to come to a consensus around uh, and to then cra uh, crystallize a plan that's, that's effective and, and well received by the entire public. This is our initiative to try to do the education piece of it. As many of you know, there was a, a, a panel that was uh, convened by the mayor, uh, headed up by uh, 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 Mr. Butt and uh, Mr. Uh, General Robles from USAA uh, to pull together folks that kind of understood what direction we wanted to take and start at a high, much higher level than where we wound up. We started talking about where do we attack this issue first? Is, and we talked about all those issues that all of you know are, are relevant. Uh, is it at the parental involvement level? Is it at the uh, you know, early education level? Is it the dr at the dropout level? Uh, which one of those, those initiatives do we want to take on first? And after a lot of study and a lot of uh, discussion, uh, we focused in on, on the early childhood component of it and went through that process to try to identify how we would go about doing it. I think there's a lot of uh, perhaps misunderstanding, uh, perhaps misinformation. We hope that we, we have the opportunity to clear that up, not only tonight, but as I said earlier in my opening remarks, that we still have time between now and the election date. Uh, I know that you're interested I would encourage you to also let your friends and neighbors know how important this is to all of us, regardless of what side of the issue we're on, that education is vitally important to our community and to ask the tough questions. Uh, 
Uh, I'm here ready to take those tough questions. I've had an opportunity to speak to a lot of my friends, and unfortunately, uh, most of them know that my background and, and, and education and all those kinds of things, uh, and, and maybe don't challenge me to the point that, that I need to be challenged and answer the questions correctly. I look forward to that lively dialogue tonight and continue it until the election. Thank you very much for having us. All right, thank you, Councilman Lopez. Now, uh, Councilman Reed from District 8. Uh, thank you. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight, and uh, I really want to thank Texas Public Radio for doing this because uh, as we went through this process all the way from SA 2020 to our last vote just a couple of weeks ago, uh, we've all had a lot of learning to do, and uh, we've learned a lot. Uh, there's a few things that I think uh, we've gained some consensus on uh, as a council, and there's a few things that we still uh, are split on. Uh, the Kent's consensus side is uh, uh, we've begun to believe that really the, uh, early child education I is key. And, uh, and I, I think uh, I didn't know much about it, but I got an opportunity to hear a lot about it. And uh, so I think that is a, a place we've kind of come together and said we need to, need to focus on that, not just pre-K, probably all the way up to third grade. Uh, the second thing is uh, there was a big discussion about, well, should the city be involved in education? Is that even an appropriate activity for the city? And I went back and looked through uh, Cheryl's budget. It's about that thick. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of education in that budget. So the city has been in education. They have just not been directly in education. So as you move from delegate agencies or indirect support to direct support, it, there's, a, there's a lot of debate. And, and that's, what, that's what we're in the process of having. Unfortunately, uh, we didn't really see the full program until just a few weeks ago. Cheryl and her folks worked really hard. They put a program out that I think if people study it, uh, they can decide whether they're for or against it. This is not something that's got a lot of uh, hidden things to it. It's pretty transparent. But it is expensive, and it does require that we have a, a development corporation that's appointed. It does require that we enter into joint venture agreements, memorandum of understanding, whatever you want to say it, with the school districts. Now, people have different opinions about whether this would work. My personal opinion is I think it uh, is maybe not the most effective way. I've been advocating and continue to advocate for direct schools, uh, the city to do direct schools on charter basis or in some other way, and I'm advocating from <coughs> K through three, uh, and I'm advocating for the teachers to stay with those students through those five years. So I've got a little different take on it than some of my colleagues. Everybody says, well, Reed, it's a little late for you to have that take. I don't think it's ever too late to have a take. That's what we do all the way, even us old folks, we keep learning, and we got to. And so I hope that, uh, and I'm encouraged with all these people that are out here today because you want to learn, and we want to work with you on that, and we look forward to the time when we can all vote. Thank you. All right, thank you, Councilman Williams. Uh, now, uh, Jeff Judson, Senior Fellow and Director of the Heartland Institute and member of the San Antonio Tea Party. Thanks for the opportunity to, to be here. Um, <clears throat> I believe that a majority of voters would be happy to raise taxes if they thought that this plan would work. But if you look at the details of this pre-K proposal, you find out that it costs a quarter of a billion dollars over eight years. It is designed to directly serve only 2,000 four-year-olds each year at a cost of $15,500 per child per year in four new centralized pre-K mega centers, which will cost taxpayers $35 million to build. There are supposedly 2,300 unserved children in San Antonio, but we don't know who these 2,300 children are or what their individual needs are. We don't know their names or their address. They theoretically exist in census data. And as we spend a quarter of a billion dollars to start a new city-run program, there is no guarantee that parents will use it. Why do I say that? because these children are already eligible for free pre-K near where they live and where their parents work, but they are not using it. They may be enrolled in private programs. Uh, there are 678 publicly funded or privately operated pre-K facilities in San Antonio today. Why is it necessary for the city, which is not responsible for public education in Texas, 
to step in to reinvent pre-K, build four huge model centers in various parts of town, and expect the parents of these children to put their four-year-olds on a bus or drive twice a day across town to deliver and pick up their child from this all-day program. Some or perhaps most of these parents have made a conscious decision not to participate in pre-K. Maybe they are homeschooling their children. Maybe a grandparent is caring for them. Maybe they are developmentally not ready for pre-K. All of these are valid reasons to not be in pre-K. The research shows that children are well prepared to enter school if they simply have someone reading to them at home, helping them to learn about shapes and colors and letters and numbers. That is why only certain ch children are eligible for free pre-K because the research shows that homes providing this type of learning environment don't need outside pre-K to prepare their kids for school. So this is not rocket science and does not require 60 or $70,000 per, per year teachers to teach these children. Certainly there are some children who ought to be in pre-K and their parents are not making a wise decision. And we should work to improve existing programs and reach out to these parents if we can find them and encourage them to do something better. But this pre-K plan is more about politics than it is about children. It is more about building four pre-K mega centers, which will no doubt be adorned with the names of local politicians or their mothers who are still living. Okay. All right. My, I have two sentences. It is, it is about removing $250 million from the local economy and spending it on a nonproductive activity, which will hurt, not help the economic future of this city. And we can do much better than this, and I do hope voters will vote no on this proposal when they go to the polls. All right, thank you, Mr. Judson. All right, <laughs> moving on, uh, John Folks, retired superintendent for the Northside ISD, sir. Thank you very much, and it is an honor to uh, be here this evening, and I do want to say that I was very honored that I was asked to be a member of the Brain Power Task Force by the mayor, which was chaired by General Robles at USAA and by Charles Butt from HEB, to really look at what could be done to enhance education in San Antonio. We looked at a lot of things. Uh, we looked at career tech, we looked at dropout programs, but the bottom line when it was all said and done and after the we were presented programs by certain individuals, what we really came to the conclusion of was that we really needed to look at pre-K education. We needed to look at early childhood education. I've been an educator for 42 years. Uh, 21 of that as a superintendent, four as a state superintendent of public instruction, three of that as a dean of a college of education, much of that as a teacher. And I will tell you that it is so important for kids to be ready for school. What occurs in kindergarten and first grade today is so different than what most of us went through. What we do in pre-K and in kindergarten and first grade today is very, very academic. In pre-K, all students benefit from that, but especially students who qualify under the state regulations for pre-K education. We really talk about preparing kids to be ready for the workforce and for college. And in education, we talk about a ramp to college success, a ramp to college readiness. That has to begin at the pre-K level. And in fact, we start really at the 12th grade level and we back down to the pre-K level to see what students really need at each particular level to be ready to go on to college and to be successful. The bottom line to it for me as an educator and as a teacher is that to better prepare our students for success, it starts at the pre-K level. We again uh, can say there's all kinds of issues and things about the program, but as a, as a person who has that knowledge and that experience of what I have seen in public school systems throughout this state, and I've seen also what has been emphasized by this state, even with the state testing, which I do not agree with a lot of that, let me assure you of that, but I will tell you, I will tell you very simply, we have to have our kids prepared and ready to start school because let me tell you, their academic 
career begins at the pre-K and kindergarten level. All right. Moving on, Richard Pettis, president of the Greater San Antonio Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, David, and thank uh, KSTX and NowCast for uh, providing this wonderful opportunity for the citizens of this great community to listen and learn and understand the importance of this uh, issue. I'm here today representing 1,700 different businesses that employ over half a million people in this great community that we call home. And we did a tremendous amount of analysis looking at this proposal. We were skeptical. We said, here we go again, creating something that already exists. But I will tell you this, after our analysis, and we uh, analyzed this, we had presentations by uh, the Brain Power and Task Force, uh, we had uh, the city manager, we had the director of finance, we tore this thing apart. And we were looking for a couple of things, and the first thing we were looking for was the need. And that was very clear. There is a tremendous amount of need in this community. Second, we were looking for accountability. We wanted to make sure if we were going to spend one dollar, that that dollar was spent well and wisely and made a difference in the lives of children. Third, we wanted to make sure that it, this program was going to move the needle so that our young people, our, our the littlest ones, can have the opportunity to, su to succeed. Because one of the biggest challenges that we face in this business community is having uh, young uh, men and women prepared to go to the workforce. That is a challenge. And so we have been convinced by the analysis and by all the work that we've done that a quality pre-K program is that path to success for those young people. Furthermore, we believe that the accountability system and the, uh, the various boards that have been set up that are going to be governing uh, this structure make sense and will be populated by good people of this community, business people of this community as well, that can help make sure that whatever dollar gets spent, it's a dollar that's well spent. You know, we talk about education in this community all the time. We talk about wanting to move the needle. We talk about wanting to be a, a tier one city. I can tell you the path to tier one is education. And I believe, and the business community in the Greater San Antonio Chamber of Commerce believes that this pre-K for SA is the path to that greatness. And also on the panel, we have Lori Taylor. She's a professor of Texas A&M Bush School of Government and Public Service. She's not really for or against, per se, the, uh, the proposal, but she provides quite a bit of, uh, of research and knowledge about how these programs work. So, uh, Lori. And, and I want to thank you all very much for the invitation to be here and to participate in this forum, just talking about one of the very, very important uh, issues for the future development of the state of Texas and the city of San Antonio. Uh, unlike the rest of the panel, I don't really have a dog in this hunt. I, I drove three hours to get here to participate in this conversation this evening, and I'm going to be driving home three hours tonight. And uh, what you choose in San Antonio is um, something that's important to you. I'm here to be basically a resource as part of this conversation, to tell you what uh, the policy wonk and scholar community have to say about uh, pre-K, which is, uh, can kind of be boiled down into three little sound bites. One of which is that the return on investment to pre-K education is huge. Uh, you can look to a number of research scholars. I particularly prefer to look to the work that James Heckman has done, uh, looking at the return on investment to pre-K education. He's going to tell you that pre-K has one of the largest returns on investment of any uh, type of investment a society can into, whether you're talking about kind of investment in physical capital, whether you're talking about investments in plants and machinery, whether you're talking about investments at other levels of education. He's going to tell you that pre-K is where you get the greatest return on your investment. And since the man has a Nobel Prize in economics, I tend to listen to the guy. Um, <laughs> the... The other thing he's going to, the other thing the research is going to tell you is that there's a lot of difference between a high quality pre-K program and a custodial pre-K program, and that there is a lot of variability in the quality of existing pre-K programs uh, throughout the country, throughout the state, undoubtedly throughout the city, and that there are some programs that uh, are able to generate the kind of return on investment that Professor Heckman is talking about. 
And there are other programs that are really basically glorified daycare and aren't really contributing to the educational attainment of children. And pre-K, based on the research, is kind of a go big or go home kind of situation where if you're not going to offer a high quality program, there's really no return on the investment other than mom and dad don't have to pay for daycare during the period of time when the kids are in that custodial care program. So if you're going to talk about pre-K, you have to talk about high quality pre-K. You have to talk about a curriculum that is research-based, the curriculum that is going to be academically preparatory for children and not simply a situation that's uh, teaching socialization skills, although socialization skills are very valuable, that's not where the return on investment to pre-K is going to come from. A and the third sound bite that I'd like to, to emphasize here is that it's important that you think to get the full benefits of a high quality pre-K program to think about a full day pre-K program. Because one of the aspects that frequently gets overlooked is some of the very, very short term benefits of high quality pre-K, which is that it provides an opportunity for the parent who would otherwise be caring for that child to re-enter the labor force and to become a tax-paying, productive member of society. Every additional year of experience that someone has in the labor force enhances their lifetime earnings. And so a, a, a full-day pre-K program that allows the mother, typically the mother, to re-enter the labor force more rapidly leads to higher earnings not only for the child but also for the mother because of the increased lifetime work experience that she's going to have. It's only an additional year or so, but that in and of itself can be important okay, to lives. All right, thank, thank you very you. much. So if you folks would, if you have questions or comments, you'd like to queue up in front of the microphone, uh, now's a good time to do that. And I'll just get started by asking a question. Uh, this is one that we received from our listeners. Um, it was about, you know, people are wondering, I've heard this quite a bit, why do we need a pre-K for SA if we already have Head Start in San Antonio? And there have been some uh, studies that have shown that Head Start has not provided all that it could. Um, and so let me ask you that, Lori, since you've studied this, what is it w with Head Start, what are they doing wrong or why isn't it working, why mm -hmm. isn't it enough? Can we learn from Head Start what not to do if, if this passes and we want this to be a success? Well, basically, uh, I, I don't claim to have studied Head Start myself. What I've done is stand on the shoulders of giants and read the work that my uh, very talented peers have done on the area of Head Start. And basically what they're finding is very little return on investment to a typical Head Start program because the typical Head Start program is such a variable set of possible programs and initiatives are being offered to kids with some of the programs being very high quality, some of the programs being very low quality on average, not really able to detect much of a bang for the buck in, high in the Head Start programs themselves. So I think that if what the research is going to tell you is uh, to reinforce this idea that if you're not going to offer a high quality program, by which I mean a program with a a well-founded curricular component, uh, you might as well not bother. And um, Mr. Lopez, Councilman Lopez, so how do we avoid those problems if this happens to, to make sure that th there's not going to have a high level of curriculum? And then Mr. Jensen, uh, if you would. Sure. Uh, you know, that, it is a great question, uh, one that I think that a lot of folks are raising uh, regardless of what side of the issue that they're on. And the reality of it is, uh, accountability is going to be incredibly important, not only for the students that are there, but also a parental component of the accountability. We've got to do much more than what has been talked about, uh, uh, what's been talked about uh, as far as being a, a just a daycare or an even enhanced daycare. There has got to be accountability. There's got to be accountability with the parents and the children that are participating, as well as an accountability of the system to train the teachers that are there to make sure that you bring in top-notch master teachers, and then take their expertise and leverage it across the rest of the teachers that are in the environment. Remember, we're only going to have a small piece of the, of the education community uh, in, on these campuses. The vast majority of that education community is going to be back on the campuses, back in the ISDs. We've got to figure out a way to leverage what they know, what they're learning, and what they're ex uh, experiencing, and get it back into the classroom. Because after it's all said and done, these children the following year will be back in the school districts. 
I mean, it is an, an opportunity for us to make a significant difference with a, with a program that has significant accountability. And that's what's going to make the difference between this and any other program that, that's been tried. So, Mr. Judson, are you, does that uh, register with you? Do you think that there's going to be accountability uh, on, uh, that would avoid some of the pitfalls that Head Start has suffered? Yeah, well, I think, <coughs> I think there's two main issues here. One is, do we want high-quality pre-K? And I think the answer is totally yes. Whatever the research says we should do, we should do those things. Um, I have not heard a discussion uh, from any of our city leaders about improving pre-K up until this election. Why aren't they advocating to the school districts and the state legislature and to our federal lawmakers to improve Head Start and to improve the existing enormous pre-K infrastructure that we already have in the city? The a totally separate issue, a, a completely separate issue, which has nothing to do with quality pre-K, is should we create a totally new governmental layer uh, system of education that uh, does not have direct accountability to the voters because there's they're not there's no elected board that will be controlling this. It'll be an appointed board. Um, should we be creating a whole another system for an uh, an entity of government that is not responsible for for public education in Texas? Thank you. All right. Okay, from the floor, Alice. Go ahead. My name is Alice Canastero Garcia. I am a recently retired early childhood educator from Houston Independent School District. We have in place in Houston an excellent early childhood pre-K only schools throughout the city. Now Houston ISD is a huge ISD. There are a number of other school districts in Houston. But um, my question is, and thank you Lori Taylor for, for your comments about quality. Research does show that students who attend pre-K have a much greater chance of going on to a university. Um, if this curriculum is based on brain research, active learning, age-appropriate curriculum, because the brain and the body, especially in little people, are, are hardwired. Even us now, half of us are falling asleep because they've been sitting down for more than 17 minutes. My question is, what, what, um, where is this curriculum? Is it coming from the TEA, which is what Houston has based theirs on and augmented it? And let me tell you, sir, it's highly accountable. Teachers are highly accountable for each of the students in their classroom. Dr. Folks, can you handle that? Well, there's no question that you have to have a quality curriculum. Uh, if it's a high school math program, you have to have a quality curriculum. Uh, there is no question in my mind that once this program is established, that the people uh, that are the experts, which are really people like yourself, who are the early childhood teachers, are going to be able to go out and find the best program they can find for, uh, especially for the centers of excellence, because these will be set up as models for school districts to look at as examples of what they need to be doing. They will also be training centers for professional development. So if the TEA program is the best program for that, then I would say yes, that's the program we need. But if there's another program that would be better than what TEA, because I don't always agree with DEA on everything, but if there's another program that would be better that's a national program, we need to get the best curriculum we can get. And I'll look to people like, or I would look to people like yourself, to Lori and others, who really have the knowledge and expertise in that area. Councilman Williams. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, when we first started in on this, um, and the proposal was first made from the Brainpower Initiative, we were going to have two curriculums, and the two curriculums are going to compete over a period of time. And we said, no, no, we need to understand what we're doing here. We don't need a competition and four or five years later figure it out. I, I think this is uh, really an important question because we haven't heard a lot about where the curriculum is and what they're going to do. And so that's a little bit of my concern is that uh, it's very hard when you are given something uh, maybe four weeks to put a plan together, it's just simply not there yet. And, and so I, I, I understand your concern. I have the same concern. But to, to this point, I haven't really seen the exact curriculum. 
just want to remind our listeners that this is the Newsmaker Hour on KSTX 89.1 FM San Antonio. We're holding the town hall meeting on the pre-K for SA vote. And another question from the floor, sir. Sure. The question is, um, why did the task force choose early childhood education versus, let's say, uh, dropout prevention or college preparation? You're on the task force, Mr. Folks, right? Yes. Can you answer that? As I said in, in my opening remarks, and I think that's an excellent question because I think we looked at a lot of things. We looked at career tech programs. Uh, I happen to be from a state that probably has the best vocational uh, technical education program in the nation. And as we look at workforce needs, we talked about, do we look at uh, the need for vocational technical education? We talked about the dropout program uh, and what needs to be done in school districts uh, as far as dropouts were concerned. But when you look at all of those programs, then what we basically came to the conclusion of, and I say we because there were a lot of people on that task force that had different opinions, but what they came to the conclusion of and finally a consensus of was that pr the best thing to do if we were going to invest one-eighth of a cent uh, in a program, we needed to make sure that we did it in a way that the children of San Antonio would benefit from the preparation that they need to be ready to start school. And especially those early formative years are so important. If we don't do it there, we're not going to affect the dropout program. If we don't do it at that point, we're really not going to affect career tech programs and college readiness. And as I said earlier, we have to put kids on this ramp to workforce readiness and college readiness at a very early age because now kindergarten and first grade is much more academic than what it was when you and I, most of us in this room, uh, went to school. Lori Taylor, can you discuss, I mean, if you show up for school first day of kindergarten and you don't know your colors, you don't know your alphabet, you're just a blank slate, are you really destined for a, a life of academic failure? I don't think colors are destiny. On the first day of class, I, there's a long list of things that can, um, can influence the outcome for a child. I think if you encounter a, an amazing teacher, that in and of itself can offset an enormous number of, of disadvantages at home. Uh, the, the issue, though, is what can be done to put kids on a reasonably level playing field at the start. Because on average, children who come to the classroom ready to learn are on, on uh, the same level as their peers tend to succeed more than students who come to the classroom behind. And the problem with uh, some home environments is that they are not academically enriching. And that, that's not to say that there's any lack of effort on the part of the parents, but it's very difficult for parents to have the kinds of dinner table conversations that folks who are extremely well educated themselves are going to have in exposing children to a vocabulary that's substantially more rich uh, when you yourself use a deeper vocabulary in general conversations. So there are a lot of advantages that kids whose parents are well educated already bring to the table. We have a lot of evidence suggesting a perpetuation of advantage that, it, that the educated have educated children and that people who are not educated have to work harder to get their children to uh, a level playing field. So Mr. Judson, in your opening remarks, you talked about how it would be better for parents to take on these roles and to teach these children th these skills. But do you acknowledge that there may be some sets of parents who, who don't really aren't equipped or maybe they're, they're at work all the time and, and that pre-K could have a role in in bridging that gap? Yes, no, absolutely. What I said in my opening remarks was that the research shows that a, a rich home environment is equally as good as a good pre-K program. Uh, if you don't have a, a rich home environment, and there are some homes that they don't speak English and, and you just don't have the large vocabulary, you don't have the things going on in the home that would prepare the student, then that's where pre-K is very, very effective. And no argument about that. And um, that's why we have eligible groups of people that are now eligible for pre-K and, and people that are in higher income uh, homes are not eligible. 
And um, so my only argument, again, is these kids are already eligible. They already are in pre-K. There's a very, very small number who are not taking advantage of this. And if, and if they aren't, we don't really know why they aren't. Um, but uh, that's not a reason to start a, a pass a new tax and, uh, st and start a whole other city program. Yes, sir, on the floor. Yes, my name is Sal Epicelli. I'm a neighborhood group leader with the San Antonio Tea Party. And my question uh, revolves around some of the comments that have been made that pre-K is very important to give a child the ability to be able to enter the workforce and go on to college. Not all kids go to college, for one thing. But my question is, it, to me, it seems to beg the question, are our children today in the San Antonio area being prepared for the workforce, and are they being prepared for college? If the answer is no, then the question is, why not? And I would like to know if you considered that question in proposing uh, this program. Richard? Well, I think there are many programs right now that are helping and moving the, the bar uh, up on those children that decide that they don't want to go to college for whatever reason, those that want to go to uh, college. The bottom line, though, is we have so much need in this community that there are a population of young kids right now that are not getting touched for whatever reason, whether that's a home environment, whether that's resources, whether that's a transportation issue. This program, I believe, is a key to getting those kids to where we need them to be. N tomorrow is tomorrow, and we need people to jump on the bandwagon today. This is going to help us. You know, one of the biggest challenges we face in this community is workforce development issues. I hear it every single day from uh, small corporations, large businesses. We need an educated workforce. And that is at all levels, whether it's someone that has a four-year degree, a technical degree, or uh, some kind of training beyond high school. And I believe that this is a foundational program that will allow our young people to be prepared to make that decision in their life when the time comes. Okay, wait a second. <coughs> right, so. All righty then. <laughs> All right, um, Councilman, Councilman, oh, uh, Mr. Judson, you wanted to take that. Uh, I, think, I think that's a very good question. Um, I think we're going to be, first of all, even if this pre-K program were to help the 2,000 kids out there, there's tens of thousands of other ones that are still failing in our schools. We have a 30 or 40 percent attrition rate in our high schools of, of dropouts. Uh, it's an abysmal situation, and there's uh, very little hope that there's no hope that this pre-K program is going to address those fundamental issues of the utter failure of our public school system. And I, I do think this is a missed opportunity. I think there are a lot of things the city could have done of a positive nature to have addressed some of those fundamental issues, but this, this is not one of them. All right, from the floor. Yes, yes my name is Deborah Parrish. I w taught in Texas public schools for 32 years. My mother taught gifted and talented and was involved in many of the programs that are locally known of. I have two friends who teach Head Start in San Antonio ISD. They are both superb teachers, and they would be able to teach those kids anything that needed to be taught to them. However, their biggest problems are that they are dealing with parents who are illiterate, who had these children in their teens. There is no male regular figure in these children's lives. They are normally being raised by, I mean, uh, uh, Project Worth said that there were children four years ago that were 10 years old having babies. This is sinful. This needs to be stopped some way, I can't even imagine a 10-year-old girl having a baby, but it's, it happened four years ago in this t city. Now, most cases that my two friends are dealing with, the children are completely out of control because they have no structure at home. Th that's got to be the first thing you deal with if you've got 22 little four-year-olds in your classroom. 
They, they have no concept of how to behave. That wasn't how I behaved when I was four. My mother was a teacher, and I knew how to behave at four. So wh what is your question then? My question, uh, my question is, and my suggestion is, that, that if you're going to do something like this, you spend half the money on the pre-K. And don't get into these fancy buildings. We don't need that. Just give the money to the regular schools and let that back up. And then the other half put into a program where any child who is capable of being involved in conceiving a child, either the male or the female, has to have once a week some kind of training on how do you be a responsible citizen. Because that's, these kids are not being taught this. Councilman Lopez, can you address that? Well, I couldn't agree with you more that some of the, those are some of the, the things that are happening in, 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 in the families today. I mean, it's just not enough education, not enough discussion, not enough uh, not engagement, enough not enough parenting, all those kinds of things. And if there were a way to say we can fix all of that, I, I can assure you that the committee would have said let's go after one of those. When we had the discussion, and, and quite honestly, we were talking at a, about a pre-K initiative. We're talking about what could be affordable. We're talking about in pre-K, not because we're going to make the big difference in pre-K, but where the measurement really was, was what are they doing when they're in the third grade? Because what winds up happening is if they don't get the basic fundamental uh, instruction and they're habits. Ma'am. They're not Ma uh, and I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. We're overtaxed. But the issue is what can you do that gives you the best return on investment? On the, if you agree that there are children out there that are either underserved or unserved, do, how do you go after that? And where do you identify them? And where do you measure them? You measure them, I think, I think the, the, and the, uh, the statistics show it, that you measure them in the third grade. But you don't start in the third grade. You start in pre-K to start that basis of getting the numeracy and the literacy uh, uh, introduction so that when you get to the third grade, they're not learning to read anymore. They're reading to learn. I mean, that's where we have to be. If we don't do that, then we fail, and this project won't work just like any other project didn't work. We've got to do those basic core fundamentals, and those elements are included in this. And as we move through the process, I will be more than glad to continue th the opening dialogue. This is over an eight-year period, and I can assure you that this program will evolve. All right. Yes, ma'am. Hi. My name is Missy Watts. Um, and I appreciate what the professor said, her third point about um, parents being able to enter back into the workforce. My primary concern is that in 2007, they looked at low-income families and why they chose the daycare that they did. And 70% of them work irregular hours, think second shift, third shift, think retail. So if they're in school, that's great. But if they have to be transported from somewhere at 3, because school's over at three and their parents start work at three, how in the world are we covering their needs to make sure that they're gonna choose this program? That was 70% that are low income have these odd hour jobs that a normal program will not fit, but their mom or their grandma or their neighbor or their friend across the street does. And, I'm realize, and I realize that those friends and neighbors may not have the skills, but they are available so that mom can go to the workforce. So why are we not enabling the friends and neighbors to be better friends and neighbors and to really make a difference in those kids' lives? So that, and, and we have to find those 70% that are there. That's my question. So. Councilman Williams? Um, okay. One of the problems, and, and she's really uh, bringing it up, is that I guess from a from a business background, we always took an incremental approach as opposed to just wipe the slate clean. I never could come up with enough money just to come up with a whole new deal. And, and she's right. We, we have to start with the environment we're in. And, and that's why, you know, when we were talking about this, it always concerned me that while we've got, um, it's amazing, we've got 82, over 82 percent of our children uh, qualify for free pre-K. I mean, think about that. There's only five ways to qualify. And, and so that is a, is a large number of children that already qualify. The whole issue of trying to deal with this thing across the board in a large way right off before we actually know, it, it just kind of violates my incremental principles. And that's why I think we really need to focus on the children that aren't getting anything. That, because again, when I think about why, none of, why some of these children are not at all, either the parents don't know, they don't care, or they don't want them to go, they don't have transportation, as was mentioned by the last questioner, and, or they don't have child care or ways to deal with them. So we do need to tr find these children that aren't getting anything. We need to try to address those. But those tend to be 
uh, as, as uh, Councilman Lopez, those tend to be social issues that we've really got to think about. And so the social issues and the educational issues kind of marry up. You, you really can't separate them. And so when I sat and tried to talk to people, the frustration that, that the questioner just, uh, just expressed is something that I think we all do. So an incremental approach, thinking about taking it a step at a time, uh, really to me uh, it makes a lot more sense for the city to step into direct action. Thank you. Lori Taylor, are, are there studies about the demographics, about how people who are poor or English challenged areas are they able to take advantage of these programs? Is there something that prevents them from taking it, 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 these programs? Uh, I do not, I'm not particularly aware of, of any programs that have, any researchers that have really looked closely at, at the question of access. It, it makes uh, a very logical connection that transportation is an important element here. Uh, the other important element, uh, one of the elements that is in this plan is the wraparound care such that there is additional after-school program care for children to offer them um, essentially a, a, a safe place to be uh, after the school day so that the parent can complete a traditional work day or at least allow for a transition to an alternative care provider in the evenings. Richard, you know the city of San Antonio pretty well. Do you really think there are a sizable population of parents who don't want their kids to go to an opportunity so they can learn these uh, learn these skills, or they can't be bothered to take them to an all, uh, a pre-K quality pre-K center to put them on the path of uh, success. If there are, there are very few. I think uh, a parent wants the best for their children. Uh, I have three children myself. My wife's a school teacher. Um, we've been able to provide our children with a foundation that has allowed them to succeed. Um, but I am not like everybody, and everybody's not like me. And so we need to provide those uh, families that are in need with an opportunity so that they can uh, have this quality pre-K, full day quality pre-K, so that they can have that opportunity to succeed. You know, it's, it's really very simple. If we don't invest in our children at the beginning, we're going to have to pay for issues that come out at the end, at the back end. And so we as, a, we as a city need to embrace that concept of helping our young people succeed. And we believe, the Greater Chamber believes, that Pre-K for SA is that program and will be successful. Uh, but it's not going to be easy. There's going to be a lot of challenges. It's a new program. We need to work together to make it work. And I believe that it will be successful. Yes, sir, from the floor. Uh, yes, my name is George Campbell. I live in a part of uh, San Antonio, almost poised at the center of Converse. And I have observed closely things related to education, uh, particularly in the Judson School District area. But I also observed how things are going in the city of San Antonio. And I certainly agree that the basis is very important to fortify, to try the best methods. But I ask, are we not failing towards the top? Our high schools, if there's so much dropouts, where football is the emphasis, uh, where we cut teachers, where we have 14 school districts instead of four, uh, so that uh, we have to cut teachers in order to keep administrators. This sort of thing impoverishes our ideas. Also, I have noticed that in the preparation of students on the higher level, very little research is done, and they go into college in shock. We are the United States. It's 25th in the world to understand in mathematics and, and physics. This state is what, 41st, I believe, in the United States. And we're going to continue to be that way unless we get our, our priorities straight. It must be to cut down the administrative clutter that we have in the county of Behar and get into real education, which means backing up our teachers, keeping our teachers, uh, and also getting our students to do things who don't speak standard English, by the way. I've noticed there are a lot of non-standard English. We're not even getting there as well as in our technical skills. So these must be emphasized, I would say. And um, then I think our money will be well spent from the bottom to the top and then on into, excuse me, into college so that this state and this city, uh, our businesses will have qualified people and our citizens will have jobs. We won't have to import from India, from Sweden, from Singapore. 
in order to maintain a higher level. So I think we must rethink the whole system of education here, particularly at the higher level, and give the bottom its due, but also the top. Thank you. Mr. Folks, I mean, you've been a superintendent. You've seen uh, how cluttered and uh, bureaucratic uh, TEA can be. I mean, <laughs> is there a way to take a, a, a chainsaw to, to that? Yes, there's a way, but I want, can't talk about <laughs> it here. Uh, <laughs> the most important thing in the education of a child is a teacher in a classroom. And every superintendent, every administrator understands that. We can argue administrative costs versus uh, instructional costs and all that all night long. But the bottom line to what we have to look at is we have to look at kids being prepared to matriculate through a very complicated system when they do get to high school. I've heard a lot of statistics thrown out tonight, and I read a lot sometimes in the newspaper, and, and yet I know the statistics fairly well. And I will tell you, our students, and I can only speak where I was in Northside, I can't speak to all the other districts, but I know our students did very well on the measures which the state of Texas put in place for testing and also for graduation. They did very well. Uh, our completion rate for our students at high school this past year was 95.4%. Now, I will tell you, you can throw out a lot of statistics about a lot of things, but when kids get to high school today, just the basic requirements for graduation are four units of English, Algebra one, Geometry, Algebra two, Biology, Chemistry, and Physics, and then you also have World History, U.S. History, and World Geography. Let me tell you, you didn't have those kind of requirements many years ago. Now, if you plan on going to college, you can tap on top of that foreign languages, you can tap on top of that, fine arts, you can tap on that, a lot of other things. And it's easy to criticize school districts because of their band programs, their football programs, their cheerleader programs, all of those different kinds of programs which many people call extracurricular, I call many of them co-curricular, because I will tell you the research also shows that kids who are involved in activities at school, they perform the best in school, and it keeps them in school. And as a superintendent, I wanted to do as much as I could to keep our kids engaged. Yes, I was a math teacher at high school. I love mathematics. But you know, not every person loved to integrate and differentiate a trigonometric function. <laughs> and I just did not understand that. But I will tell you, a lot of kids enjoy band, they enjoy being in choir, they enjoy playing basketball. Those are the kinds of things that help make a well-rounded individual. And I will never take away from the fact that we constantly have to look at improving the academic program. But when we look at preparing kids, again, to matriculate through a very complicated system, which TEA and the bureaucracy has made it that way with all of this testing, which much of it is very irrelevant in my opinion. But I will tell you, we still have to do it because the state tells us to do it. And we have to have these kids prepared for the time they get to third grade to matriculate through that system and to be successful. And an investment in kids who qualify for pre-K is one of the best investments that a society can make for its children. I can't argue the pros and cons of how you do it, but I can argue very vehemently the fact that an investment in our young people, and especially at a very young age, is the best investment that we can make to prepare these kids to matriculate from to kindergarten to first grade and on to the third grade where, yes, they are confronted now with the state uh, of Texas academic uh, readiness test, which is very, very difficult. And as they matriculate through the system, they have to pass 12 exams in order to graduate. And I would love to bring the algebra two or the physics exam in this room 
and administer that test to the people in this room. It's a tough test. I, I've seen what they've, they have, they're confronted with. So, when, you know, as we look at the challenges that education is facing, I will tell you, they are many, they are huge, I understand all that, but let's help our kids be successful. That's the bottom line to what I say. All right, Mr. Judson. Sure. Well, the, um, the questioner asked a, a fundamental question about a fundamental problem that, again, this pre-K uh, program will not address. And um, we talk about investing in our kids, and that's, that issue is, is settled. We're already investing in pre-K. The question is, why not fix the investment we're making instead of adding another investment on top of what we're already spending? I, I would also just say that, um, that the issue of administrative bloat in our schools is, is, a, is an issue we just can't seem to, to get beyond. Um, I know um, w we live in the Alamo Heights School District and the uh, Texas Association of School Boards did an, an audit of Alamo Heights and told us that we were 47 percent understaffed administratively. And I'm just, I'm just thinking, how can we even survive when we have half the staff that the education establishment tells us we should have in our administrative office? That's one of the problems that we have in our public school system. All right, you, Mr. Folks, real quick. I'd like to agree with him on, on the point about the state of Texas is going to have to address the funding system and the equity system within our school districts because that's one of the biggest issues that we have. When you that's look a difference, a whole I, different I know, kettle of But that gets into the issue that, that he is addressing there, and that is a totally different issue than what right, we're right. talking about. Okay, and it's a whole different firestorm, I tell you. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to break format a little bit because we're, we're lucky we have a, a resource here. We have a city manager, Cheryl Scully, and she was very instrumental in, in putting this together, and I would like to hear from you particularly about some of the questions that, uh, if you could want to step up to this microphone, that Mr. Judson brought up, or here's a wireless if that's working. Um, you know, they said um, questions about multi-million dollar facilities that have to be constructed. Is, is that true? Or how, how, is this, how will this actually work? Who qualifies for this? So the program that we were asked to put together was a business plan to support the task force recommendations. And what we did, uh, was take a look at the amount of revenue that was generated by the one eighth cent. And I should point out that uh, there is a state limit, 8.25 percent. Uh, Austin, Dallas, Houston, El Paso, Corpus, they're already at that limit. Some of them have been for a long time. So uh, San Antonio is the one city, the one major city that is not at that limit. This will generate. Uh, about 30 million on average over the eight-year period and we have taken a look at all of the existing school buildings that are vacant or perhaps will become vacant we've looked at vacant structures in the community and we expect that we will through with the four facilities uh, be able to renovate existing structures uh, and or work with the private sector in lease a structure that is either constructed or renovated by them uh, because the tax hasn't passed, and there's a little bit of chicken and egg here, we don't have uh, all of the facilities identified yet for the program, but we are working on that and have looked at more than a dozen uh, school buildings in the central city as well as vacant structures throughout the facility. Uh, in the adopted budget that the council just adopted last week, there are some capital dollars that are savings from other capital projects where we've come in under budget uh, that have been identified to make them available for renovation of some existing facilities. So that's taken into consideration as well. Uh, so the, the actual program is, and it's a balanced budget for the eight-year program, and it is sustainable. Uh, the operating revenue is not only generated by the one-eighth cent but also uh, the additional dollars that will be available from the state and federal programs that we'll be able to leverage because we're investing more in our early childhood education uh, will bring more dollars for education to the community. And, but for these dollars being available for pre-K through this sales tax, we wouldn't be able to uh, bring those additional state and federal dollars to the community. Um, 
couple of things as I was making notes as people ask questions. On Head Start, there are 21,000 children in Bear County who are eligible, three and four year olds for Head Start. With the dollars that come into this community, only 7,000 of the eligible children are served. So that, those are, that's the facts today. Uh, secondly, uh, the research that the task force discussed and all of that is available to the public if anyone wants copies of what they looked at, what they studied, is compelling that the best return on investment is in pre-K education. And the city has been in the education business. We have about $104 million of our budget dedicated to public libraries, to the Head Start program that we manage for the community, literacy programs, after school uh, academic programs in partnership with the school district, summer job, youth employment, so uh, scholarships to the San Antonio Education Partnership. So we are in the education business, as you noted uh, earlier. Uh, parental engagement. Uh, this program will require, will provide wraparound services, as uh, was mentioned, that is so necessary to help and support families, but it will also require families to commit to work with their children. So there will be a, so to speak, contractual arrangement between the families and uh, uh, those who are participating in the program so that they will support and participate in the activities at uh, the learning centers. The program uh, will be ramped up, so it's eight years. The first three years will be a ramp up of the program. That is two centers open the first year, two more centers the second year, Three, year three will be of operation. Fourth year, we'll get into the competitive grants. So in when we're operating in full capacity, about 3,700 children per year will be able to be served, and that's 3,700 four-year-olds on an annual basis. Over the eight-year period, about 22,000 children, 22,000 four-year-olds who don't have full-day pre-K today uh, or are in half-day programs but want to be in full day will have uh, access to this program. And so the council, when they decided to place this on the ballot, their conclusion was that it was worth the investment to serve 22,000 four-year-olds to give them a better chance of succeeding, completing high school, and being prepared to go on to college. Okay. Um, one This is Newsmaker Hour on KSTX 89.1 FM San Antonio. We're holding the town hall meeting on the pre-K for SA vote. We just heard from City Manager Cheryl Scully. And Councilman Reed Williams, you said you wanted to respond real quickly. Just a couple of questions and just a couple of facts, that, uh, questions you asked. By the end of about four years, we'll have about $35 million in these facilities. So that's uh, just so that everybody will know that. And, and, and I know uh, this is a point of contention, but when we, we uh, voted, to put this on the ballot, we didn't all support this. We thought that the plan was quite well defined and well enough defined for the public to understand it, but there were three of us that didn't vote uh, and said that this, we thought this was the answer. We thought that this was a clear enough uh, plan so that people could make a decision and that the public should make a decision. Thank you. Well, Mr. Judson, uh, one of your points that you brought up in the opening statements is that you didn't want to have centers named after the mothers of politicians. Uh, Cheryl Scully didn't address that fact, but was there anything else in there that you wanted to respond to? Well, um, I expect that I'll, I'll disagree with Councilman Williams a little bit that this is, I don't think this is ripe for uh, voter approval yet. I think there are so many uh, unanswered questions that the voters really sh shouldn't be asked to vote on this in six weeks or, or whenever the election is. Uh, we don't, as we heard, we don't know what the curriculum is going to be. Boy, that's a fundamental issue. We don't know where the location of these centers are going to be. If you're looking at whether or not your child is going to go there, that is a fundamental issue. Uh, we don't know, it's my understanding we don't have any idea how many uh, school districts uh, are going to be participating in this. The memorandums of understanding are being negotiated now, and those MOUs will not be um, not be completed until uh, the end of the year at the earliest. So after the election, we will know uh, if the school districts are going to participate, which ones, if any, and uh, and on under what 
uh, restrictions that the city is going to put on it. And to me, those are such fundamental issues that affect the success or failure of this that we, we should put this on hold and at least work those out before we're asked to vote. Okay. Good evening. I'm, I'm, I'm Charles Vethan. Can you I'm, move the microphone up a little bit? Absolutely. Go ahead. My name is Charles Vethan. I'm with the Vethan Law Firm, one of the underwriters of this event. So you may wonder, why is a law firm underwriting this event? Very simply, our business focuses on engineering, high-tech, and the medical industry. In the last four years, when this country has gone through its present recession, my clients involved in this sector have not been able to fill jobs that require an expertise in math and science. So as a result, what we've had to do is had to shepherd in individuals who come in here on H-1B, v, uh, H-1B visa or other promotional programs to assist them. I've got kids, and I'm looking at the San Antonio market. We are one of the major metropolitan centers in the country. We are attracting businesses from Mexico because they want to get away from the violence there and resettle here because of the, the linguistic advantage as well as the cultural advantage. They can't hire people who have the basic skill set in the high-tech market. If San Antonio intends to lead in this digital century, and you want to establish some basics as to getting your pre-K kids hardwired to learn math, science, and technology. I've got a question to both Mr. Judson and Ms. Taylor. How do you make sure that this program would have a, institute a non-custodial pre-K program? And if you didn't want this program, Mr. Judson, what are the options you would propose to have the kids in school today be able to have these high paying jobs in 20 years? Mr. Judson, can you respond? Um, I think that uh, we do need to continue to improve the pre-K programs that we have. Um, and uh, that's obviously a Herculean effort, but w we have a system that's funded and operating and we should improve, try to improve that existing system. As far as, um, Improving the school system, um, I have long been an advocate of greater parental authority over uh, the education of their children by being able to choose the school that's most appropriate for their child. And um, I think in the Texas legislature this coming year, you're going to see uh, school choice coming up. And I think that, uh, and the research shows that the effect on the public school systems in the cities and states where school choice is available around the country, that y it has improved the public school systems because when uh, parents have the ability to make that choice which is best for their child, the child immediately benefits from that and um, the schools uh, quickly see that when they're losing children they need to focus on the things that are really important to those parents. And when that's the hardest thing is getting large bureaucracies that have all of these demands from Austin and all these uh, ta tax tests, uh, star tests, and all of these uh, bureaucratic uh, uh, things that are pulling them in all directions. It's hard to get large bureaucracies to focus on a customer that has no choice. They're assigned to a school and there's nothing they can do but but uh, have their child enrolled there. So I think right. that's the fundamental thing that we can do to improve public education. Right. What I'm hearing is there's a sense of urgency that uh, something action needs to be taken now uh, to try and, and, and resolve this or put kids on the right path. And we have kids, if, if we every year we skip, we lose more kids who, who don't have the opportunity to break out of the cycle of, of poverty. Um, and so you know, a question was also addressed to, to you, uh, Laurie. So can you kind of talk about uh, how a program like this would lead eventually to more STEM qualified uh, employees? Sure. Well, I, I think I'm, I'm probably better qualified to, to speak a little bit about how you get to a curriculum sure. that would lead to those kinds of, of STEM prepared individuals. And I, I think you, you have to have a, 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 con a continuously iterative process. You start with uh, research that, that's formally looking at what kinds of curriculum have been adopted elsewhere, what they're doing in, in Houston ISD, what they're doing in other school districts that are successful in Northside and the like. 
uh, then you uh, ad adopt and implement, and then you have to have a, a period of evaluation. You can't become wedded to your first blush uh, curriculum model such that you're not willing to adapt it in the, in the face of evidence. And so one of the things I, I, I do very much like about the Pre-K for SA program is the evaluative component that there is in the budget. The, uh, li what looks like a little sliver of the budget, but from a researcher's perspective, it looks like a nice sliver of the budget, <laughs> uh, to, to look at whether or not the programs are working. Assessment. Think, uh, an assessment of the success of the program in uh, outcomes for children. And I think you need to use that not simply as an evaluation of the program, but in a formative sense of helping you to iterate towards a more effective curriculum, figuring out what's working, do more of that, figure out what's not working, do less of that. And I, I think that one of our problems nationally is that we can point to some very effective high quality programs, but we aren't particularly well informed about which elements of those programs are the key essential elements that have to be replicated and which elements of the program are frills. Okay. And what San Antonio is proposing might help us answer some of those questions. All right, we've got time for two more comments or questions from the floor, and then we're going to do uh, last closing comments from the panel. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Davies. My name is Rudy Rodriguez. I represent the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And I, I think first and foremost, there's no doubt that our, the advancement of our children's education is job one. Number two, I, I'm very sensitive to many of the comments that were made here tonight. Uh, certainly this young woman's le message on parenting hit home. I mean, it's, it's one of our key issues, there's no doubt about it. But as we look at the emotional issue here of whether it's an educational drive or a political drive, uh, for us in the business community, it's also about that return on investment, taking the pure emotion out of it. What we as a chamber have come to the realization is, is that we are not keeping up with the workforce demands for the next decade or two, given the attainment that we have today. And that we strongly feel that we have to advance that and implement a program that will supplement that to the degree possible. I would perhaps direct this question to either Mr. Pettis or, or Councilman Reed, um, or Councilman Williams, but yeah. while many times uh, the various chambers in this community are not uh, always on the same page or always in concert, I can tell you that for the first time in a long time, all seven of the local chambers are all endorsing this program. And I would ask you to please comment on why you think that is, strictly from the business perspective. Mr. Davies, thank you for your, taking my question. Is there anything in response? Want to respond, Mr. Williams? Yes, sir. Well, um, we're, we're in tough economic times. Um, there's no doubt about it, and it, it's not going to get better anytime soon. Uh, so I can tell you that if I'm a business person out here, the last group I'm going to try to irritate is the city. We put a hat, we put uh, about two million dollars a year, billion a year in our budget. We, every five years, we approve a 500 million dollar budget. Uh, so I, I'm not saying that they uh, are voting one way and saying another, but right now today, I've heard from several people say, well, you know. It's not that much money. Over eight years, it's $250 million. That's a lot of money. But more importantly, if we don't get this right, we're losing eight years of kids. And that's my concern is, is, is how do we make sure that we work on this and find those 2,300 kids or 2,500 or 2,000 that are getting nothing, that, that really are not getting served at all. And, and uh, that, I believe that, yes, the, the, the mayors are all for it. The chambers are all for it. But I'm still not convinced that this is the very best way or even a successful way that we can go about approaching our children in this pre-K program. I believe it's a linear thing. It takes more than one year. You have to stay involved in it. And I'm just still looking for the answer. Thank you. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Sir, my name is Pamela Gabriel Craig. I'm an attorney here in San Antonio. This is for the superintendent. Sir, can you tell me why you've extended the half-day pre-K program into a full day? There are uh, two districts in Thank San you. Antonio that have half-day programs. That's the Northeast Independent School District and the North Side Independent School District. Primarily the reason they have half-day programs rather than full-day programs is because of the growth in those districts and the, and the facilities just not being available. Uh, there is no question that the research shows a full-day program 
uh, for students, uh, pre-K students, is better than a half-day program. We would love, I think, both in Northside and Northeast, uh, and I'm retired, I'm not speaking for them, but I can tell you when I was there, I would have loved to have had a full-day program uh, in our district. We just didn't have the facilities. I see this as an opportunity to move some kids uh, into the centers of excellence that could be in a full-day program. There would be some there. But eventually, the school districts are going to receive some of this money, and it's going to allow school districts like Northeast and Northside to expand their pre-K programs and very possibly in those pockets and areas that really need the full-day program, they can do that. So I really see this as a great advantage to those districts who right now only have a half-day program. Okay. Um, one last question from the floor, then we'll take final comments. Uh, my name is George Blessing. I'm with the Defense Language Institute. I'm Chief of General English. My question is about the feeder schools. It's great to have a pre-K program, but what is being done to marry the feeder schools with the pre-K program to define the curricula and to assure that the kids that are moving through the school system at the third grade or at the sixth grade are actually achieving the goals and the objectives of the education that you've laid out for them? That is the, that's the real concern. You have to have the whole community involved in the education of the child. It can't be just preschool. It has to be the system working together. We know that even with Head Start programs, it doesn't just affect the poor. It also affects those people who are slightly above the poverty line. The schools become better if the schools, especially the feeder schools, are partnering with the, with the preschool program. What is being done to marry this these two groups. Mr. Folks, can you address that at all? Because it's an I, education question. I can address it. I'm going to go, I think, uh, no, I'll go ahead. Uh, I oh, think Ms. Scully could be okay. much more specific than I would be okay. about it's that. It's a great question. And in fact, uh, many of the task force members and the school superintendents, as we've talked with them, have brought up the same question. So this program needs two things from the school districts their children identified in the past through additional state funding and in exchange we will work with early childhood educators for additional training and professional development and it is about not just the pre-k teachers of the four-year-olds but also the k-3 teachers and so the memorandum of understanding that's been drafted with the help of experts one of the leading attorneys in the state of texas uh, david thompson uh, who is an expert on education law in Texas, helped us develop uh, the MOU th uh, for this program, specifically addresses making sure that the education, training, and development is for K-3 teachers. And so in exchange for the school districts identifying the kids, passing through the additional state funding, we will provide professional development and training for early childhood educators including K-3, working with the school districts on curriculum alignment so that the teachers in the school districts are best prepared to take on these better prepared children. So we will provide better prepared five-year-olds as they enter kindergarten, we'll track their success rates, adjust the program as the program continues to make those adjustments and also professional training and development for their early childhood teachers because we know that the public schools have suffered tremendous cutbacks in funding and when they get cuts they often cut training and development for their teachers and that falls sometimes on the kindergarten through third grade teachers so this program will provide in-service training it will provide substitute teachers for the teachers to participate and shadow master teachers at the centers uh, for uh, the centers of excellence and uh, provide that training so that they're better prepared, ha can see some of the best practices, share some of their own knowledge of early education. So this last question is a good summary one because it really speaks to the heart of the issue. How do we not only prepare the children to go into kindergarten ready to learn, but then help them succeed K through three as well as those teachers that are so important in their lives? All right, so let's, we're going to have to wrap up. We're just simply out of time.
I w we d they're just going to they're just going to real briefly going to summarize, and we're just going to have to wrap up. Unfortunately, we're out of time. It's just the, the reality of, of things. I'm sorry about that. All right, um, all right. We'll, we'll begin with uh, Councilman Lopez of District Six. Sure. Uh, thank you, and I'll, I'll be brief in my in my closing remarks. Uh, the big question I think that all of us should walk away and trying to get answered is: Do we believe that there is a class of kids out there that are either underserved? because they're only going to a half-day program or not served at all because they're not taking an advantage of any kind of a early childhood program. Uh, if that's the case, what number is okay? I know that there's been some suggestions that there's not a whole lot of those kids. Well, I can tell you that there's thousands of them, and that is not the number we want in this city. Uh, so I think as we walk out of here trying to answer the question, the first one is to do we think that there is a class of kid out there that is either underserved or unserved. And if there is, what are we gonna do about it? This is our best attempt, I think, and a very good one that's been well thought out, uh, you know, to make an impact on those kids. Clearly, there's gonna be accountability issues. We intend to work on that. Uh, and uh, I wanna thank all of you for your time and interest. We do have right around 50 more days before this election goes, and there'll be a plenty of opportunities, I hope. Uh, I'll certainly make myself available, and I think everybody else will, that wants to get the information out uh, to have that dialogue. So thank you very much for being here this evening. Councilman Williams. Well, thank you very much. I want to appreciate uh, uh, everybody being here, and I'll also say I'll stay around if uh, some of the people that didn't ask, get to ask their questions, we can huddle up over here, and I'll pass my time. Thank you. All right, and uh, Mr. Jeff Judson of the <coughs> San Antonio Tea Party. I think this, uh, as I think, I hope we've gotten across that um, there's a lot of agreement about the importance of pre-K education um, the disagreement is whether this new program is necessary and if this program is going to deliver what the city needs. And I, I think the answer is clearly no. This has the aroma of politics all through it, and I think that's what's really driving the, uh, the issue here in San Antonio. This isn't really about... It's not really about kids. It's not really about education. Well, what, is, tell me, what does that mean, has the aroma of politics? Well, what do you mean? What I'm, I'm about to explain. What, what it means is that this is, education is a very, very important issue to, the, to voters. Uh, every politician wants a little piece of education so that they can say they've done something. Well, the city doesn't really have jurisdiction over education, so they have created now a large pre-K program so that they are now doing education to please the voters, and I think it's a, w this is rushed. It was rushed through city council, um, and, it's, and it's not appropriate to take it to the voters when there are so many unanswered questions. So thank you. All right, uh, Dr. Folks. The state of Texas cut $5.4 billion out of public education. The state of Texas has not but put a priority on public education. I'm thankful that I, as a teacher, am in a place where we have a mayor, we have a city council, and we have a city staff that have worked with school superintendents and other educators to come up with a proposal that, yes, we'll put some money into education, but we'll put it into an area of education that is of vital importance to the success of our kids. It's up to the voters. There's no question about that. It's up to the voters. But I I'm just thankful that we have the opportunity, and especially as a teacher, that I have the opportunity to go to the poll and to vote how I feel about this particular proposal. Twelve and a half percent of one penny is something that I'm willing to say yes to as far as the support of our kids. Thank you. Richard Pettis, President of the Greater San Antonio Chamber of Commerce. Thank you. Successful businesses invest in themselves. Successful cities invest in themselves. This community deserves the best. And as uh, Dr. Folks has said, we're talking at a v about a very small investment to move the needle in a very positive direction that's very necessary for all the citizens of this community. The business community is 100% behind the pre-K for SA 
we believe that it is an opportunity for us to move the educational bar in a positive way for the citizens of this community. This community deserves it, and this community needs to do it. Thank you very much. And finally, uh, Lori Taylor, Professor, Texas A&M Bush School of Government and Public Service. You, obviously, you said before you don't have a dog in this fight. You're not going to lobby one way or the other. But, you know, as an educator, as a person who studies this, I mean, what do you, what do you draw from this exchange? I draw from this exchange that this is um, a model for the d policy debate about programs and initiatives uh, throughout the state and something that I would encourage my students to uh, participate in, this idea of bringing together people from all sides and asking them tough questions and listening to their answers is uh, remarkably innovative and uh, very attractive. Um, I think that there is a strong consensus in the literature that high-quality pre-K has an enormous return on investment. I don't think that's the question under debate here. I think the question is one of implementation, and I think that uh, reasonable minds can differ on the question of implementation. And I'm just very uh, pleased and honored to be able to participate in the conversation. Well, thank you. This has been the Newsmaker Hour on KSTX 89.1 FM San Antonio. We've been discussing the pre-K for SA San Antonio proposal. goes to the voters on November the 6th. For more information about this issue, you can go to our website, tpr.org. I'd like to thank Nowcast SA for videotaping and streaming live this public forum. Thank all of our panelists and all our great folks in the audience. A big thanks to our underwriters who helped make this event possible, Vethan Law Firm and ESD Digital Advertising Communications, and the fine members of Texas Public Radio. I'm David Martin Davies. Good night. <laughs>